Hey brothers and sisters in the Lord, thank you for joining me. This is Watchman Brooks. Thank you for your time and your fellowship, your loving and prayers. I, uh, welcome to this ministry. If this is your first time watching here, what we do is we uh, fellowship and talking about end time prophecy, eschatology, events that are happening, signs in the earth beneath and signs in the heavens above, whatever it is that the church that at, at this state and time is failing to do, what uh, pastors of this church age, of this date and time, who don't even want to talk about the book of revelations in fact that it, in fear that it will scare the congregation won't tell you and mostly uh in which uh, some pastors of this day and age who are so prideful to let go of old teachings that when the lord god is showing us new teachings um they're felt they're failing to let go of that and, and and teach what the lord is showing us all like the lord jesus said those who have new wine say that the old wine is better uh, so I present to you what the Holy Spirit has presented to me with evidence confirmation that your faith may be strong and that you may understand what is going on at the time at hand. At least you, as 1 Timothy 4 1 says, uh, at least you be uh, deceived into doctrines of demons. Um, so uh, we're going to jump right into this, but first I'd like to always start off with prayer. Uh, that way you, the church, may know my heart and my thoughts and understand that I serve Christ Jesus our Lord by serving you. Amen. So if you can give me grace and uh, let me present my heart and my mind uh, to the Lord. The Lord God, I thank you so much for what you've done for us this day, the church, your body. Lord God, I pray that whoever you bring to this ministry may be able to have Christ grow more in their heart and let me decrease being a servant of the Lord God Almighty. I pray, God, that with the teaching in which you have given me for the church, your treasure, I pray that it is given to many of your brethren who love you with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, all their strength, that the Holy Spirit can continue to do work while he is here on the earth for the increase of God's church, the body of Christ. Lord, I pray that in all that I do, uh, it may be good, acceptable work to produce fruit, may it stretch out and go as far out as you will, and let your will be done, for I'm just a servant of the Lord God who wants to add to your kingdom. And I know that my work is done in vain, and knowing that uh, the desires of my heart, O oh Lord, if that is to teach, if that is prophecy, is for the edification, comfort, and exhortation of the church, O uh, oh Lord. And, and in all that I do, please give me a humble heart. Let me stay humble uh, under the mighty hand of God, knowing that you will exalt me in due time, and that I look to your blessings and your rewards uh, with, with my brothers and sisters who fellowship with me. And I ask all this, O oh Lord God, for giving me, asking your forgiveness for my sins and their sins. Uh, at least we don't, because we don't know now what we do. But we know that if we confess all our sins to you, you will forgive us because you are faithful. And, and because the blood speaks greater things than that of Abel towards us, O oh Lord. So thank you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so folks, what we're going to do is talk about this man right here. This is going to be a six-part series that I'm going to present to you all, in which we will, you can see all the topics right above me here. And what you will see is it will be a six-part series that will show you how the Holy Spirit is showing us that this man right here, Prince Hassan bin Talal, is and will be the Antichrist. Now I say will be the Antichrist because he's not that man now. He was going, he's going to play into that role at a certain time. And to give you some context about that, let's go back to scripture and remember Judas. Judas and the Antichrist have this one title in the Bible that's not meant, that's not given to anyone else in the Bible, which is called the son of perdition. Now, Judas being the son of perdition and the Antichrist being the son of perdition, it means something important if it's only given to these two individuals who has significant purposes to the will of God and the fulfillment of God's word. Now, what I want to bring up to you is that notice that Judas was the son of perdition, but he did not become that man to betray God until a certain time. Once the last supper, Jesus dipped the bread in the, in the cup and Judas ate the bread and Satan entered him. Then he went on to betray Jesus with 30 pieces of silver and kissed him and betrayed him. But it wasn't up until that time when he took, ate the bread, Satan entered him, he became the son of perdition. But all throughout the ministry of, in the gospel, when he was counted among the 12, he was not that man until that time. He was going to be that one. He was going to fulfill that purpose as the son of perdition. 
one Satan, enter him. Likewise, this man here that you're seeing, uh, Prince Hassan ben Talal. What you're going to see in this six-part series will explain how he will be the answer Christ and how the Holy Spirit is showing us, just like Jesus. Jesus was saying all throughout his ministry, this will be the one. One of you, are, I picked you all, except one of you are not mine. You're, you're the devil. So Jesus pointed out, just like the Holy Spirit is pointing out, who the son of perdition is so it's not surprising that we're seeing this now because in the era of in the gospel the holy Spirit, jesus was pointing out this is going to be the guy this is one of the one of you are not mine he kept hinting and showing that this would be the one and likewise we're seeing all you're going to see through this series in the holy spirit not me the holy spirit would give you understanding to show you how this man here prince Hassan ben Salal, will be the son of perdition the antichrist so we're going to start off with the patriarchs we're going to start off with this series here and and understand who prince Hassan is you can't just jump into this guy and figure out oh this is the answer christ but just because he says because he's the one that fits this goes way back he's almost 70 years old so we're talking about 70 years of his life plus plus his ancestry his his heritage, his the predecessors of his royal family, which came before him, ties into why he's doing what he's doing. But spiritually, he's playing into Satan's plan to want to rule the world, which will ultimately be God's plan and which will result in Jesus conquering what Satan wants to fulfill his desire. But first, let's start off with this man's uh the father of this kingdom, this this family known as the Hashemites, the Hashemite uh, kingdom, or the Hashemite dynasty, the, the royal Hashemite family. It all started with their great great grandfather, uh, Sharif, which is Arabic for protector, and Emir, which means like general of Mecca. It's Hussein bin Ali. Hussein bin Ali had an ambition uh, during World War II. World War One's British colonial imperialism, uh, World War One. He had an ambition at the at the end of the Ottoman Empire when the Ottoman Empire uh, came to collapse and came to an end. Uh, Hussein bin Ali had an ambition to want to be the king of the Arabs. He wanted he had a vision of uniting Arabs under one kingdom where he would be king because he was already this person here. In this land of Hajjaz or kingdom of Hajjaz where Mecca is right here when well, currently Saudi Arabia but before it was Saudi Arabia it was called Hajjaz or the kingdom of Hajjaz and him uh, Hussein bin Ali was the Emir and the uh, Sharif of the holy places in Mecca and he was a descendant of uh, uh, the Prophet Muhammad so he had the honors the position and he had credentials being the bloodline descendant of the prophet muhammad so you can see that this man was quite established man within among the arabs who had the credentials plus he had an ambition to run and reunite the entire arab world not be just the king of arabia but who wanted the arab world uh united under one where he would be the king so we're going to look at some historical context of this so you can get a full understanding from, <clears throat> from professionals and you're going to see um, video footage, televised footage of this man and that time so you can have a clear understanding of what this man's ambition is, the beginning of the Hashemite family, dynasty, monarchy, and will lead all the way up to Prince Hassan ben Salah. And that way the Holy Spirit will give you full understanding of what's going on. So let's begin, right? Amen. In the Hejaz, in Western Arabia, Sharif Hussein, its ruler, was set on extending his political and geographical domain. He believed he might be able to do it with the help of the British. In turn, the British were impressed by Sheriff Hussein's family credentials as custodians of the holy places of Islam. They call themselves Hashemites. They're called the family Hashemites because that's the family or the tribe of the Prophet Muhammad. They were the Bani Hashem, the sons of Hashem. So he was, Sheriff Hussein was the leader of the Hashemites. He was the person responsible for Mecca and Medina. And although he worked with the Ottomans before the First World War, once the First World War happened, he saw this was his chance. A chance, too, for the British, who saw support for Sheriff Hussein as a way to threaten the Sultan's hold on the Caliphate, the political leadership of the Islamic world. The British, because they were fighting the Ottomans, and the Ottomans were claiming to be the real representative of Islam, they wanted a counterforce. 
and the counter force was represented by Sharif Hussein, being a descendant of the Prophet. But Sharif Hussein was speaking of liberating Arab lands, building a new national state. He wanted to be king of the Arabs, not simply of Arabians. In July 1915, Sharif Hussein smuggled a message to the British High Commissioner in Cairo, Sir Henry McMahon, offering to raise a substantial Arab force against the Ottomans in return for British support for Arab independence. In the ensuing secret correspondence between the two men, Sharif Hussein was given to understand that he could expect British support in achieving some of his ambitions in the event of an Ottoman defeat. This letter of October the 26th, 1915, outlined the main points of the arrangement. The actual document itself is absolutely riven with ambiguity. There's no doubt about that. The question is whether Hussein recognizes that. My sense of Hussein is that he does recognize it. In other words, there is no wool being poured over his eyes because he's perfectly aware that if he's going to create a modern Arab empire, he's going to need some logistical, economic development, and that can only come from the outside world. Taking Britain's assurances of support at face value, Hussein, together with his sons Faisal and Abdullah, amassed a sizable force. The new army was commanded by the young and charismatic Faisal, who had captured the imagination of the Arab masses in the quest for Arab independence. Yet even as Hussein and Faisal mobilized their troops, the British were preparing to sell them short. Back in London, in the spring of 1916, Britain was negotiating with France about the future shape of the Middle East. Behind closed doors, Sir Mark Sykes of the British Foreign Office had been meeting his French opposite number, Francois-Georges Picot. Britain knew it was vital to offer the French a stake in the spoils of the Ottoman Empire, should they win the war. There was an awareness on the British side that they had made such huge sacrifices that one couldn't just ignore um, the French ambitions and that the French were determined to have their historical piece of the Levant. Pouring over a map of the Levant, Sykes and Pico personally drew in the areas they wished to see under their control. Their secret deal amounted to the virtual carve-up of the Middle East. In Area A for the French and Area B for the British, the imperialists intended to exercise power indirectly. They would appoint advisers and take charge of the finances in their respective spheres of influence. Then there was the area colored blue, which was to be directly controlled by France. This included what was then known as Greater Syria, where the French traditionally had commercial and religious interests. As for the area colored pink, known as Iraq, with its strategic ports, railways and oil, this was to be under British rule. The area colored yellow represented Palestine and was envisaged as an international zone, except for Haifa. What the British wanted was the oil of Iraq and they concentrated on getting Iraq and getting away from Iraq to the Mediterranean in order to transport this oil. So they got Haifa on the Palestinian coast and they got most of Iraq. The Sykes-Picot agreement was a pretty shameful document and uh, I wouldn't attempt to defend it. But it was drawn up by people who were sort of operating under the old um, kind of balance of power considerations in an imperial uh, frame of mind. Unaware of these secret dealings behind their backs, Hussein and Faisal proclaimed independence and in June 1916 attacked the Turkish troops. The Arab revolt against the Ottomans had begun.
The Turkish garrison at Necker was soon overrun, and the seaport at Jidda seized. By 1917, Hussein and Faisal's forces had pushed north and engaged the Ottoman Turks along the Hejaz Railway. The British saw the Arab revolt as part of its strategy for creating a military diversion against the Central Powers. In a pincer movement, Britain had launched a campaign from the southwest to ensure control of the Suez Canal and the Levant. And from the southeast, it was fighting to secure the oil wells of Iraq. All this to attack the Central Powers at their weakest point, the Ottoman Empire. The Arabs hitched their fortunes to the British. They considered themselves to be fighting with the Allies. But at the same time, they were not merged into the British army, that they continued to act as an independent army called the Northern Army. While the Arab army advanced northwards, Britain's General Allenby had crossed the Suez Canal. And by publication of secret treaties, by the Bolsheviks certainly created enormous suspicion in the Arab world. And this meant that the Sharif Hussein and the others said, wait a minute, what's going on? What, A, why are you not giving us independence? And secondly, why are you dividing us up into zone A and zone B? And at that point, of course, the Arabs realized that not only had the British got their own particular interests, for example, in the ports of Palestine or in Iraq, but that they had promised other things to the... Fearing that Hussein and Faisal might lose heart, the British government forwarded a message to them reiterating British commitment to Arab independence. The Arab race shall be given full opportunity of once again forming a nation in the world. This can only be achieved by the Arabs themselves uniting, and Great Britain and her allies will pursue a policy with this ultimate unity in view. Hussein stayed loyal to the Allied cause, still prepared to accept Britain's word on Arab independence. Although he spoke... Allenby's forces entered Damascus. With their ally, Faisal's northern army, they had pushed the Ottoman troops north through Palestine into Syria. The Arab revolt did contribute to the victory of the Allies. First of all, it protected the British flank in Palestine. Second, it kept a number of Turkish and German troops preoccupied. And third, the, the British could have never legitimized what they were doing unless they had the blessing of a particular Arab force. On the 3rd of October, the people of Damascus flocked to Faisal's victory parade. If he was to seize power, he knew it was of great importance to make his presence felt and to be seen by the Arab people as their liberator. Later the same day, however, Faisal met with General Allenby at the Victoria Hotel in Damascus. Allenby warned him that his rule in Syria would be limited. The British by that time knew that they were going to hand over Syria to the French. So they couldn't actually accept Faisal as a legitimate ruler. All they could do is to pay him uh, his salary and the expenses of his army and his administration. Undaunted by Allenby's warnings, Faisal assumed the title of governor of Damascus. With the support of his father, Sheriff Hussein, he set about creating a power base for their goal of an independent Arab state. On the 31st of October, the Ottomans were finally defeated. The peace conference at Versailles began in January 1919. 
national self-determination. Once independence had seemed to be a possibility that this principle of self-determination uh, supported by the Americans was going to be offered to all those who were to be liberated from former empires like the Habsburgs and the Ottomans. What the Palestinians wanted was an independent state. In fact, Faisal had come from Damascus to plead the Arab cause. But the future of Palestine in the Middle East formed part of Britain's pledge to France in the Sykes-Picot Carver. In the event, Woodrow Wilson's principles about self-determination were forgotten when it came to the people of the Middle East. Britain and France were free to go ahead with their agreement. The Versailles Peace Conference was concluded on June the 28th, 1919, with the creation of the League of Nations, the first global institution for peace and security. Its covenant provided that the Arab and other territories ceded by the defeated Ottoman Empire should be administered by mandates, which meant, in effect, that Britain and France were given the authority to impose their rule over the Arab territories. On November the 21st, 1919, François-Georges Picot, the co-architect of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, and the French General Gouraud arrived in Beirut. And so began the imposition of the French mandate for Syria and Lebanon. The British forces, who had occupied the region since ousting the Ottoman Turks during the last months of the war, were handing over power to the French, thus fulfilling their wartime pledge. Faisal, who had been the governor of Damascus now for 16 months, had been consolidating his position. When he was proclaimed king by the Syrian National Congress, the French were incensed, and General Goro sent in his troops. By August the 7th, 1920, Faisal had been deposed and had to flee to Palestine. The promises to Sharif Hussein and Faisal of a single independent state were now a distant memory for the Europeans. The whole issue of spheres of influence meant that what appeared, what was at first appeared to be a willingness to accept a single Arab state was in fact seriously diluted. And then on top of that, of course, the very fact of there being a French area and a British area meant that in effect this was the seed of partition. So you had both independence was denied, but also the unity of this area was denied. The boundaries and governments of the Middle Eastern states that emerged bore the unmistakable imprint of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. The French half of the previously Ottoman province of Greater Syria became the mandate for Lebanon and Syria. The other half became the British mandate for Transjordan and Palestine. In the east, the Ottoman area of Mesopotamia, which included the oil fields of Mosul, was given to Britain as the mandate for Iraq. So this was basically the importance of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, to divide what is called the Fertile Crescent between Iraq and Syria and let Britain get access to the oil of the area and be able to exploit it in the future. But British rule was initially rejected by the Iraqi people until Faisal was installed as king in July 1921. Britain hoped the limited power it devolved to him would serve to placate the frustrated demands for Arab independence. But Sheriff Hussein expected more from the British. He never gave up the idea that the British had promised him independence, not only in Arabia, but in Syria and Iraq as well. And he wanted the British to fulfill their promises. Sheriff Hussein's dream of an Arab kingdom ruled by the Hashemites was only partially fulfilled. For although his other son, Abdullah, became king of Transjordan, their old rival, Ibn Saud, swept the Hashemites out of Hejaz 
when he conquered the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. Enraged at being shut out of the new government, 100,000 armed Iraqis revolted in July 1920. In the Iraqi view, of course, this is the first national rebellion against British colonialism. It took the British three months to crush the rebellion. By 1921, Colonial Secretary Winston Churchill was determined to end direct British rule and install a British-friendly Arab leader as King of Iraq. He invited Prince Faisal al-Hussein to become ruler of the new state. Even though he was not Iraqi, but was instead a member of the Hashemites, the ruling family of Mecca. Faisal was a descendant of the Prophet, and thus he had sort of religious credentials. He had Arab nationalist credentials in the sense that he was a leader of a revolt against the Ottomans in the name of Arabism. Generally speaking, he was considered to be quite moderate and willing to accommodate British interests. In August 1921, Faisal was elected King of Iraq in a dubious referendum. The Hashemite monarchy was considered as foreign by many Iraqis. The real problem here was the monarchy was seen as sort of a tool of the British. The Anglo-Persian Oil Company, which since 1914 also had a holding in the Turkish Oil Company, was now in charge. She accepted the French as the heirs to the German interest, but no American oil companies. Washington was up in arms against the British monopoly and demanded its own concession for Standard Oil as an alternative. Due to British pressure, Baghdad denied this request. Alan Dulles, the Near East representative at the State Department at the time, was a particularly persuasive advocate of an open-door policy. In the end, London yielded in favor of Standard Oil and its ruthless president, Teagle. It needed American funds for the development of the Iraqi oil fields. Standard Oil took over the leadership of an American consortium, which was given a holding of almost 24%. The newly founded Iraq Oil Company was made up of five partners. The negotiations were only completed a few days before oil gushed out of the first oil well in Baba Gugua, near Kirkuk. The British interests in Iraq were now administered by King Faisal I, who, after his coronation, was received by King George VI in London. As a Sunni Muslim and a member of the Hashemite dynasty, which had been expelled from Saudi Arabia, Faisal was disliked by many Iraqis, especially by the Shiites. He was regarded as a minion of the English oil imperialists, who could only rule with their military assistance. Okay, so pretty much as you can see here, I'm just going to pretty much uh, paraphrase everything that you can, so you can uh, condense all that information. But there's no way I could convey all the historical footage, documents, and um, recorded interviews that you just saw on my own. It's better that you just see it yourself, see the footage yourself, see the characters, the players involved, see it yourself. But to summarize it again, we have a Prince Hassan bin Talal, right? Prince Hassan bin Talal great 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 grandfather uh, Hussein bin Ali who became the king of Hashaz all right king of Hashaz he was the descendant of the prophet Muhammad of the Hashemite family and so he had uh, was one who fought against the Ottoman Empire so he was one to push this ambition of Arab nationalism to have the Arabs as a national state just like the United States of America wasn't always United States or independent states and then we became the United States and we all became Americans the same thing which uh, Hussein bin Ali is trying to put forth uh, with the help of the British because the people over in the Middle East that he wants to rule over don't have the technology and the means to make it more modern and industrialize it like the British can so you need so here's what I'm saying watch this folks he needs European uh, Western help to facilitate that so he's weak without the West's 
help in facilitating this, which is why the British gets involved. Now, if you go back to Daniel chapter 2, you get to the era of the toes uh, mixed with iron clay. It says that one will be partially weak, partly strong, and the iron shall be in the clay of the feet mixed with iron and clay. One shall be partly strong and partly weak, and the iron shall be in it. So you see how the iron, Europe, will be in the clay, Middle East. So you see the same thing that's happening here with the facilitation of the Europeans wanting to, or Hussein wanting the Europeans to help make this dream of his, of this Arab national state, he needs that. And the same thing, Daniel chapter 2 talks about the iron shall be in the clay. They're parallel to one another. But going back here, paraphrasing again, we see that King King Hussein uh, was king of the of Hashaz and the holy sites of Mecca, and then his son became uh, his his, predecessor, his successor, uh, who became who was uh, Ali bin Hussein. But because then the rise of the Saud, the Saudi uh, House of Saud, uh, which later became Saudi Arabia. Uh, the House of Saud was their uh, adversaries and beat the Hashemites out of Hashaz. So what ended up happening was the prince, I mean King Ali, excuse me, King Ali lost his throne. He abdicated, stepped out from his, gave up all his titles, being Sharif and Emir of Mecca, gave that all up. And uh, Hussein ended up losing his kingdom there. But as we saw in the clip, we saw that later came Faisal. Faisal, who was then placed as a governor of Syria when the French took over the uh, Syria from the French mandate, but the people in Syria wanted to make him king of Syria, and the French didn't like that at all, that he wanted to make it king, and so the French then took that, and he lost the throne, uh, but later became king of Iraq, because the British also ruled that area, and figuring to make Faisal king of Iraq what kind of you know, squash the whole uh, animosity between the Arabs and the British since that would help, or they thought it would help, uh, with regards to um, the uprising and revolts between the Europeans and Iraqis. And then came the Kingdom of Iraq under the rule of King Faisal. King Faisal also had a son, uh, King Ghazi, who also had a son named King Faisal II. So what you're seeing right here now is just three kingdoms of the Hashemite kingdom. Now, if you just step back here and look at all of this, you'll see that this area, which we see right now, was ruled once by the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. It was, uh, or the Hashemite kingdom. This man, King Hussein, had and his sons was really stretching out throughout the Middle East to have this region, the Levant, have this region under his control, under his monarchy, under his realm, uh, in his royal family. So I just want you to wrap your mind around this. This area once was a dynasty of the Hashemite family. But then King Faisal became king, and here are some clips of King Faisal, which will go really quick, and so you can visually see this and get a full understanding of what it is that will happen that has already happened. Amen? All right, so let's take a look. Okay, so in this footage here, uh, what you'll notice is this is uh, when King Faisal II, which is Prince Hassan bin Talal's, um, this would be his uncle, no, his cousin. This would be Prince Hassan bin Talal's cousin. He becomes coronated and he becomes king and his coronation uh, is seen here with the Iraqi flag, as you see these uh, two stars on it. Uh, but not, what I want you to notice before I even jump into this, before we remember, I want you to mention, remember something. Remember how prophecy talks about there has to be ten kings. And if you've been watching in fellowship and you're been fellowshipping with me throughout this time period, you notice that the ten kings are the ten royal families of Europe. And I said that there are only two remaining that has to be replaced by kings: uh, Queen of England, which is Queen Elizabeth, and Queen of Denmark, which is Queen Margaret. Uh, those two thrones has to have a king on them, and then the ten, the royal, uh, the ten kings would be fulfilled so there's 10 royal families of europe just so happen to be allies of britain in fact i think they're all cousins believe it or not but nonetheless what i want you to notice is that they're all allies of britain and if you go back to the sykes pico agreement you'll see that uh, it was written even though they did not honor what Al hussein bin ali wanted they said in the document that once the Arabs come together as one, they said that Great Britain and her allies will help them. Great Britain and her allies. So you have Britain, 
her allies, which are nine of them, will then help. So you can see how the how prophecy, end time prophecy, correlates to what we're seeing in the past because that's what exactly was going to happen. The ten royal families of Europe, with this one Arab, Prince Hassan bin Talal, will unite the country or unite that region in, or in, in in hopes of Arabism. Okay, but with the help of the ten royal families, which will leave which will be uh, run and, and controlled by uh, Pope Francis. Pope Francis will be the one which they would, they would give authority to. But nonetheless, this was uh, King Faisal II coronation. And uh, at the coronation, what happened was he was then a uh, uh, crowned king. And I want you to notice that this was a public event. Uh, when kings are crowned, it's a public event. There's nothing hidden, nothing secret, nothing under the rug. It's public, which goes back to Revelation two, verse Revelation six, verses uh, two and three, which talks about the first seal. The first seal it talks about there's a white horse. Being, it's Pope Francis. Uh, the rider shall sit in him, Prince Hassan bin Zalal, and it says that a crown is given to him. So that implies that this person will be crowned king. Any man given a crown that's called king has been since biblical times still is today isn't it quite amazing though when you think about it how the lord god would tell us his people in understanding the events that's going to happen that will lead to the return of his son to be to be so important that it will he will lynch it to an office that has not changed since biblical time period the office of king we, he would tell us to pay attention to not prime ministers, ambassadors, United Nations representatives, presidents, uh, or secretaries of states, you know, not anything like that. But he would tell us, look at kings, the office of kings, the place where kings are. So when you look at this king, this, uh, this prince, when he's crowned king, it's the same thing as it was in biblical times when people were crowned king. So the whole, from biblical time to present, the Lord had picked kings for us to watch because it's the one office that doesn't change coronations are public princes are crowned kings so when the first seal happens it's just a representation of this and that so that you understand that when the first seal happens and a man is crowned king it will be a public event just like what you're going to see here The Duke of Gloucester arrives in Baghdad to represent the Queen at the enthronement of King Faisal of Iraq. Crown Prince Emir Abdullah, who has ruled the land during the young king's minority, accompanies the Duke from the airfield to the center of the capital. Later, the King and the Crown Prince's uncle arrive at the Marchlis, the Houses of Parliament, for the actual enthronement. The Duke of Gloucester enters the building. The 18-year-old king, at his inauguration ceremony, will become the third reigning monarch of modern Iraq. Wearing the uniform of field marshal, the king enters the chamber to address the assembly of delegates of 33 countries and to take the oath of kingship. King Faisal, who was educated at Harrow, became king at the age of four when his father, King Ghazi, was killed in a road accident. During his speech, the young king asks his people to unite in support of him for the welfare and prosperity of the country. The duke and the other guests leave as the ceremony ends and the king makes his way from the marchless to receive a loyal greeting from all who have gathered in his capital city. With the Emir Abdullah by his side as always, Faisal assumes the kingship of a young and vigorous state, struggling to modernize herself without sacrificing the great traditions of culture and social grace, which are part of the Arab heritage. Okay, so in this one here, what you're going to see is, <clears throat> what you're going to see here is how what's the word I could say, the relationship between the British and, or the Europeans and the uh, Hashemite kingdom or the Hashemite dynasty. So that there is a commingling with the two. There is a partnership or an alliance, an understanding, a good 
a standing between the two so that you can fully understand Daniel's chapter, uh, Daniel chapter 2 with the era of the toads mixed with iron and clay. Because if you go to all the previous nations before that in the statue, what you saw was, oh, here's King Faisal with King George the Sixth. Queen Elizabeth's mother, uh, King George the Sixth. So this man, Prince Hassan bin Salah, his cousin, King Faisal II, is was friends with the current Queen of England's father. So there is a history between the two, Europe in particular, and the Hashemite Kingdom, his royal family. They're not strangers to one another. Do you understand what I'm getting at? But going back to what I was saying about the statue, you, if you go back to the statue, you saw the head of gold, which was Babylon, right? There was no partnership between anything. Then you have the Medes and Persians. I mean, you have the, the Medes and Persians, which what became one nation, the Persian Empire. Then you have the, the bronze, which was the Greeks. Then you have, and mind you, with the minerals that God depicted between the, uh, uh, the Babylonians, the Persians, the, the, the Greek being the bronze and the iron being the Roman Empire, there was no other ethnicity inside of that, of those minerals. Or in other words, there were the kingdom inside of those uh, minerals, as you see with the iron and clay. What you see is that in, I saw the iron mixed with clay. So there is an alliance between the two. So here I want you to listen to um, King Faisal. So he was, also was educated in Europe, in Britain, in, in Harrow. Uh, so I want you to listen to King Faisal so you can just understand how these guys speak and how move, how moving they can be to the Western world, not just some desert folks, quote unquote, desert folks uh, crowned with king, kingship with fancy clothes. So I want you to listen to King Faisal II as he sits with the King George the si King George the Sixth, I believe, of England. affords us the opportunity of recording with feelings of the utmost satisfaction the cordial relations which prevail between our two countries. We trust that your visit to Great Britain may afford you much interest and pleasure and we extend to your majesty the sincere wish that in health and strength, your reign may be long and happy, and that your labors may be blessed with all the rewards of progress and endeavor, bringing to you and your people the lasting contentment of noble achievement. My Lord Mayor, Aldermen and Commons of the City of London, I regard it as an honor paid to my country that you should receive me at Guild Hall. These ancient walls remind us of your glorious history and your long tradition of civil liberties, of which you should be justly proud. To take this opportunity to acknowledge on behalf of my government and my people the important part which the City of London is playing in the ever-expanding economy of my country. Iraq is today a large buyer in our part of the world of British manufacturers. But as our development program is gradually implemented, there will be an ever-increasing demand on our part for your manufacturers and for the skill of your people. I assure you that we look forward to such a prospect of even closer collaboration between us in the economic as well as the political field in these promising days in my, con in my country's history. Please be assured of our gratitude and appreciation. So 
So as you can see right here, folks, uh, King Faisal II was definitely someone who had, was in good relations with the British throne. And that is something is in relation to Prince Hassan bin Talal, unlike any other dynasty or monarchy in the Middle East at that time. Because remember, prior to the Hashemite kingdom, there was no such thing as kingdoms of Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, I mean, Iraq, Syria, uh, Jordan. There was no such thing. It was all ruled by the Ottoman Empire. So you're seeing at the birth of this new era, the dynasty, the growing dynasty in that region befriends, befriending and continuing friendship with the British throne who in today their descendants still alive still royals still being educated in britain in europe speaking different languages of the europeans friends with royals as we're seeing then so what there's nothing new under the sun pretty much so again just to squeeze all this in context here as we just mentioned before so we see that king faisal ii is the king of iraq and we see also how King Abdullah end up becoming King of King Abdullah the first becomes King of Transjordan at the time before it was called Jordan it was called Transjordan. Now here's something to note about King Abdullah the first. King Abdullah the first is the third son of King Hussein bin Ali. So you have King Abdullah being well before he was Abdullah he was called the Emir because uh, after the Ottoman Empire. Jordan wasn't considered a kingdom yet. In order to be a kingdom, it has to be a king. There was no king uh, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. But we see uh, he had Abdullah, and he see we see he had Faisal, and we see he also had Ali. So here's some footage of uh, Abdullah. So you can have a full understanding, see the video from the time period, and have a full understanding as to who this man is, which is Ben Hassan Ben Talal's grandfather. All right, so I hope you watch this and uh, give me grace. I know this is a long video, but you need to see it, and I think it'll be worth watching. Amen. So in this picture here, what you'll see, let me pause it real quick. See, it says King Faisal. This is uh, King Faisal the first of who was, uh, uh, de I would say, demoted or kicked out of Syria, later becoming king of Iraq. So this is King Faisal the first ruler of Iraq. Look how they spelled Iraq at the time, right? With his brother Emir Abdullah. So he was Emir Abdullah of Transjordan, not King Abdullah of Transjordan. So I just wanted you to understand that first before we jump into this. And what happens is this is where he is with his brother Faisal right here, King Faisal the first. So now you see that the brother Faisal becomes king, and Hussein bin Ali is just just promoting his sons to build this kingdom of Arab nationalism uh, that he envisions with his sons being the rulers of the realm. So you see Faisal the first and Abdu Emir Abdullah of Transjordan together, which is then just, he's just simply, it's political. He's showcasing his brother so that his brother could then transform Transjordan into the kingdom of Transjordan, which would be his brother. In addition to that, what you'll see is that his coronation here, we'll just skip a little bit of footage. This is when his, his coronation, uh, Abdullah becomes king of Transjordan, as opposed to the emir of Transjordan. So you see how Hussein bin Ali how now has three sons, yeah, now had three sons at the time, king of Hashaz, king of Transjordan, King of Saudi Arabia, King of Syria, and King of Iraq. Those three realms, those three realms was once occupied and ruled under the Hashemite family, under the Hashemites uh, and the bloodline of the Prophet Muhammad. So you just want to understand how these three realms, these three countries, or these three uh, locations in the Levant was once concentrated under one royal family. Now if that doesn't really spark your interest into what Daniel's talking about with regards to the kingdom of the clay. Remember, iron mixed with clay. I don't know what else to tell you because you're seeing with video footage, and it's so crazy too when you think about it, how the Lord would have at the end time an era where if you needed to see anything, it's all recorded television footage. It's all recorded 
footage with journalists interviewing people and, and commentating on what was seen at the time. There's <clears throat> nothing to speculate, no misinterpretations of historical books. You can see it, the video footage of the family and how all this became to be. I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable the Lord picked this time period to be a time period at the end times, to, to be able to have without question, without doubt, to look right back at it and see, wow, Iraq, Syria, uh, Hassaj, Jordan, once the, pretty much 90% of that area of the world of the Levant was ruled by one family. So here's when things get a little tricky now. It's when Israel becomes a nation. Watch this. So we now have when uh, all that realm is becoming occupied by the Hashemite kingdom, with the exception of Syria, which is ruled by the French. And then in 1948, Israel becomes a nation and everything changes. So watch this. October 1947, two shiploads of Jewish refugees from Europe attempt to land in Palestine, only to be turned away by the British and shipped to internment on Cyprus. The British mandate in Palestine was about to end, however, and the United Nations was debating the partition of Palestine between the Jews and the Arabs as a solution to the turmoil in that country. In May of 1948, a new Jewish state, Israel, was born in a bath of blood. Jewish troops routed Arab forces from the city of Haifa in the first of a series of battles that were to reverberate through the years. In the year of independence, fighting was fierce in the Negev desert area. Here, Israeli troops routed the Arabs and took hundreds of prisoners. Meanwhile, on May 14, 1948, the new government headed by David Ben-Gurion is installed in Tel Aviv. Thus, for the first time since the Roman legion destroyed Jerusalem in the year 70 AD, the Jewish people have a nation of their own. United Nations teams accompany Israeli soldiers under the white flag to retrieve the bodies of soldiers killed in the continuing strife with Arab troops. The UN was able to effect some uneasy pacts calling for a truce, but skirmishes continued to break out. Dr. Chaim Weizmann joined Premier Ben-Gurion in the government. The Jewish patriot became president as Israel went before the United Nations to seek a place in that world body. The Middle Eastern Arabic nations were in violent opposition, and when Israel was voted a membership, they walked out in a body. For the rest of the day, their seats remained empty, but they returned the next morning, no further incident. Thus, history was made as the Jewish state of Israel was born. Conceived in strife and weaned on violence, Israel has flourished to become a constructive voice in world affairs. Her flag became a symbol of hope in a troubled world. Jewish immigration increased under British rule following World War I, when Britain implemented the Balfour Declaration, promising a Jewish homeland in Palestine. This measure conflicted with Britain's previous promise of self-rule for Arab inhabitants throughout the region. Britain was basically extremely supportive of the Zionist movement. It helped to establish all of the structures of a state. At the same time, the Arabs of Palestine were denied the right of self-determination. The Palestinians saw a European power decide the future of a non-European territory in flat disregard of both their presence and wishes. In the 1920s, as land was being stripped away from local residents, the first clashes between Palestinians and Jews began and would continue on for years to come. Until the early 1930s, the Jewish population of Palestine remained under 17%. Hitler's rise to power in Germany completely changed that. 
In just five years, 174,000 Jews flooded into Palestine, doubling their population. As the world attempted to make amends for the horrors of Nazi genocidal policies, efforts to make Palestine a Jewish homeland increased. The Palestinians, they were not the Nazis. They were not responsible for the Holocaust. But they were the ones who paid the price. In 1947, with the conflict spiraling out of control, Britain decided to turn the problem of Palestine over to the United Nations. The UN, under pressure, proposed to divide the land into two states, an Arab state and a Jewish state. Arabs were to be given 43% of the land, despite the fact that they made up more than two-thirds of the population and owned over 92% of the land. Jews were to be given 56%, although they comprised only one-third of the population and owned less than 8% of the total area. Nevertheless, they were given not only most of the land, they were given the most fertile land. Zionist leaders took advantage of their superior military preparation and immediately began occupying major Arab cities in Palestine. I was among the people that conquered Akko. When we were walking around, we entered the flat. There was a pair of shoes of a small child, maybe two years old. They didn't have time to put on the shoes, so they left the shoes and they ran away. They left everything. We found out that there was a systematic expulsion of Palestinians and there was, as I said, there was an ethnic cleansing operation taking place. The most infamous campaign was the massacre at the village of Deir Yassin, where over 100 men, women and children were systematically murdered. <laughs> The ruthlessness of the attack on Deir Yassin drove fear and panic into the Palestinian population and led to the flight of unarmed civilians from their homes all over the country. As a result, maybe 300 or so thousand Palestinians had already been expelled before the first Arab soldier entered Palestine. Some of the neighboring Arab armies finally intervened after May 15, 1948, when Israel officially announced its statehood. Although there was a lot of war rhetoric on the Arab side, very few soldiers, Arab soldiers, were sent into the... Although there was a lot of war rhetoric on the Arab side, very few soldiers, Arab soldiers, were sent into the battlefield. And actually, for most parts of the war, there was a superiority uh, on the side of the Israeli uh, army. The Israeli army cleansed much of the territory and took over a large part of the designated Palestinian state. The new state of Israel encompassed 78% of the total land of Palestine. The West Bank came under Jordanian control, 
and the Gaza Strip under Egyptian dominion. So, folks, as you can see here, what became an issue is that Israel became a nation, and then that started to, well, the displacement of the Palestinians start to spill over into neighboring Arab towns, and that really changed everything that was going on. The whole British mandate thing with the French mandate, that all stuff started becoming a thing in the past because the displacement of the Palestinians being that they're Arabs, their Arab neighbors start having contentions with the newly formed state Israel. And that really just start building this animosity, this hatred, and all this violence in that region. And with Prince Abdullah, or excuse me, King Abdullah the first, who controlled the West Bank at the time of uh, Jordan, King Abdullah was trying to broker just peace with Israel since they were his neighbors. And King Abdullah doing that uh, was was, a pro was looking promising to be able to calm things down in that region, uh, being that he was part of the Hashemite family, descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, plus he was a king, and, uh, uh, and his father was one of the emirs and sharifs of the one of the holy places of Islam in Mecca. So he was pr look, he looked promising to be able to befriend Israel and try to calm things down with all the uh, violence that was increasing due to the displacement of the Palestinians. But it, it paid severely, and not just him, but also uh, his uh, nephew, King Faisal II, uh, with this right here. Amman, capital of the Jordan, there is mourning in the palace and great sorrow in the hearts of the people. The king who made them a nation is no more. In the great Arab revolt, King Abdullah fought alongside Lawrence. He learned to love Britain, and in these days of trial, he was our friend. For this, he died. To the old city of Jerusalem, King Abdullah went for the Friday prayers. Among his own people, he walked unguarded and unafraid. But there were those who hated him. And as the king entered the mosque to pray, a young fanatic killed the one man who might have brought peace to the Middle East. A brothel fair was a contest for international prestige and the graceful airy United States Pavilion with its cheerful showcasing of America's everyday life showed in favorable contrast to the looming Soviet exhibition hall. America won a triumph on the cultural front, but the Kremlin in 1958 took the initiative in the global power struggle. Khrushchev's wooing of Gamal Abdel Nasser brought new upheavals in the Middle East. Strengthened by Soviet arms and economic aid, Nasser began the year by joining Egypt and Syria into the new United Arab Republic. Pan Arabism was on the march. Nasser was its prophet, and there was dire peril for friends of the West, such as King Faisal of Iraq and his uncle Prince Abdel Elah, whose attempt at united front with Hussein of Jordan was ended by an army-led revolt in Iraq. Faisal, his uncle, and Premier Nouri S. Said, three of Nasser's staunchest foes, were slain in a wave of shocking violence. So, folks, uh, we're wrapping up right here. Thank you so much for still staying with me, uh, for giving me grace. Uh, I really hope this is really putting the backdrop as to understanding how all this is going to play out. But what you can see is basically that King Faisal was killed. Him, his uncle, who was crowned prince, the royal family, except one survivor. Uh, they all got together. They all got together at the palace. Was put in front of a firing squad, and they were killed. In addition to that, uh, King Abdullah was murdered. And at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and his son King Talat takes the throne. Uh, but what you're seeing here was a revolt against those who were friends of the British, uh, who were the ones responsible for Brit for Israel becoming a nation. Uh, so the Arabs really took that to heart. If they couldn't defeat the Jews at the, for displacing the Palestinians, they went to the Jewish allies who were the British, and, the, and those allied to them were the Hashemite family, which then stopped the monarchy here from being a Hashemite kingdom in Iraq, and which then stopped the, this particular king uh, passing the throne to his son, King Talal. But so far, what you see with this map here, folks, is you're seeing how these two regions here 
uh, these regions here were controlled by the Hashemite family, the Hashemite kingdom, or the Hashemite monarchy was all ruled by one particular family. So when we see Daniel's prophecy again talking about the kingdom of clay, it's not rocket sciences to try to figure out who this is going to be. In addition to that, watch this. The reason why you saw, I mean, in addition to the video we just saw, it said that the Soviets start endorsing Nasser uh, from Egypt as he was pushing, pushing and promoting Arab nationalism. Now, what's surprising is if you go to Daniel chapter 11, uh, towards the bottom of the chapter, it talks about the king of the north and king of the south. I'll put it right above me where you see it. You see that the Antichrist will enter the glorious lands, many countries that fall, uh, Ethiopia and Ethiopia and Libya shall follow him, and he shall enter Egypt and take to destroy Egypt and take the precious things of Egypt, the gold and silver and such. And Egypt shall be toppled by this king of the north, this particular Antichrist. And it's so funny that we see here that it was Egypt, as in addition, it was Egypt who's also trying to push this concept of Arab nationalism. So you're having a power struggle between Egypt taking the lead, trying to structure Arab nationalism, and the Hashemite kingdom, the Hashemite family, trying to structure Arab nationalism. So nonetheless, we see that King Tala end up becoming the person who would be the one to take the place of his father, King Abdullah. And this is just some stock footage. Okay, and uh, what I just want you to just point out, or what I just want to point out is pretty much he picks up where his father left, saw, leaves off, and he becomes the new king of the uh, Heshemite family, the new king of the kingdom of Jordan that his father established uh, following, the fa following his father's dream of having a kingdom uh, under the Heshemite uh, family. Uh, the thing about it, though, that you'll notice with this is that he started modernizing it and started bringing it into its own identity. But the problem is, is that he then went kind of crazy for some reason or another. We really don't know what it is that happened, but he suffered schizophrenia and gave up the throne. And then the throne was then passed on to his eldest son, King Hussein, who became the king, the, the new king of the Heshemite family, in addition to... Uh, he having another son, I think he had several sons, but another son that King Talal had was Prince Hassan bin Talal, who we're studying today. So this is where we are right now with regards to uh, with regards to Prince Hassan bin Talal. And this is his family, this is his heritage, and then it came the royal standard of the Heshemite kingdom, uh, which you see in the bottom right corner. This is the Heshemite Heshemite Kingdom's royal family uh, or royal standard flag. So you're seeing this flag here and you're wondering, well, what did all that mean? Why is there one flag there with all the other lines behind it? Well, here's why. You have one with the Heshemite family rule, which is the Kingdom of Hussaz. You got one black, okay? And you see another one or one red. We can just follow the red ones, one for one. Then we see the Kingdom of Jordan ruled by the Heshemite family, two for two. Then we see the kingdom of Iraq, which is ruled by the Heshemite family, three for three, and along with Syria, which was ruled by the Heshemite family, four for four. So this royal standard reflects the family that ruled this entire region, the Levant, at a certain time. But since we're discussing Prince Hassan bin Talal, I want you to remember how they all wanted to, his royal family, the Hashemite, wanted to rule the Arab world with their with them being the ruler of the Arabs. So if you see that happening then, and scripture tells us that which has been is what will be, that which is done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. How we saw back then Arab, uh, a, a promotion or a initiative and ambition to have a Arab national state with citizenship for all it's not funny to see now egypt also pushing for a coalition of arabs with just this was as of february this this year and as of today egypt's uh egypt's new king or egypt's new uh i think what is he called president egypt which i think he will become king uh egypt's this man general sisi or president sisi will declare Egypt a kingdom because scripture says the king of the north, the king of the south, he's not a king yet. So I believe that he's going to be established as a king. So watch for that. But he also has a plan. Egypt 60 announced his plan to unify regional force at Arab League Summit. So now you see Egypt doing what Nasir was doing, that the Heshemites were doing, that we're seeing happening now. 
be seeing a parallel because well, there's nothing new under the sun which was done before is will happen what will be will be done so we're seeing it again but going back to this man here Prince Hassan bin Talal he was born on March 20th 1947 a year before Israel became a nation now also being that he was born on March 20th 1947 if you go to March 20th his birth date his birth date of this year that just happened there was also an eclipse that happened this year which is I find it so remarkable how you can have this man that we're looking at to be the Antichrist and have his birthday be on the on the on the uh, precipice of Israel becoming a nation just on the cuffs of Israel becoming a nation right before it happens officially where Israel becomes a nation on March 20th and then for him to be the Antichrist or for him for him to be the man who we know will be the Antichrist, we see that on March 20th, where uh, his birth date, we see that there was a eclipse, which happens to be uh, one a, eclipse that fell on the first month of the Jewish calendar. So you're like, well, what does it have to do with anything? This is what it has to do with, because God said that when He created the sun and the stars and the moons, He says that they shall be for signs and seasons. So they should be for signs. Number two, you go to Acts chapter two, verse seventeen. It says, "In the last, in two seventeen through twenty-one, in the last days, God said He shall pour out His Spirit, sons and daughters shall prophecy, uh, some shall see dreams." But He says, "That should be signs in the heavens above, and signs on the earth beneath." So we're seeing things moving into position as it relates to end time prophecy, and we're seeing things happening in the sky, like the blood moons, but also this, which is kind of weird that His birthday and this eclipse happens. But even more stranger than that is this, folks. Watch this. So we see how he was born on March 20th, 1947, and how he will be what we believe to be the Antichrist. This will be the man. He will go to be that guy. But let's go back to when Jesus was born. When Jesus was born at his birth, if you look at scripture, it says that there was a light in the sky. So at the birth of the Christ, there was a light in the sky, a great light in the sky. Remember that the three wise men followed? It was, and they followed the moving star. And it was a great light in the sky at the birth of the Christ. So what would God do to show of the birth of the Antichrist? What, would, what could he do? Well, look at this. As there was a bright light in the sky for the Christ, it would make sense that the Lord would put a bright darkness in the sky at the birth of the Antichrist. So just as there was a light in the sky at the birth of the Christ, there was a great darkness in the sky at the birth date of the Antichrist. Just look at the parallels with that, right? Look at the parallels with that. One who would be the Christ, big old shining bright light in the sky at nighttime. One who would be the Antichrist on his birthday, big old darkness in the sky at his birthday. I just find that remarkable. All right, that there were, that that was there. So I'm just bring it to you. Let the Holy Spirit do as do as He wish. But nonetheless, I want to just thank you all for joining me. I'd like to all also welcome you to my new channel. I'm gonna start filtering everyone to this new channel. This is where you'll find. This is where you'll find me now. And most of my work. I'm praying that the Lord take this ministry to another level. He's really showed me more things than I could ever imagine. Take me places where I never thought it could have been taken. And having believers like you fellowship with me, then I never thought would ever reach. And I'm, it's just a blessing to be in your service to serve Christ. And now I just want to pray that the Lord, with your prayers, to take this to another level, uh, to the point where I could feed my family off this. I could wake up and do this for a living. So I'm just funneling everything to this new ministry here, Christ Watchman Ministry. And you can follow, not me, but follow Christ with me uh, with on, watch, uh, on Facebook, Google+. Plus. Twitter or Instagram and of course on YouTube so everything's gonna be rolling towards there so if you want to tell your friends about it and other brethren that you share the videos with and the study with it would be so thankful uh, to let be partakers with you as the Holy Spirit used me to use you and then use you to reach others and we're just all part of God's work as the Lord Jesus said that the Father was working up until now and then he's working now the Holy Spirit is in the place of Christ and the Holy Spirit is doing work and we are doing work with him in the field before the harvest amen and the lord said that our work is not in vain all right and let everything be done uh for the glory of god so you may give the water i may plant the seed but god gives the growth amen so we're all in this together i share you his treasure as he shares it with me freely i share you his new wine praying that other people would take the new wine and if those don't want to take it saying the old wine is better meaning the teachings that you're seeing here 
what can you do? Let the Holy Spirit's will be done. So thank you for watching this. Next episode will be, or next teaching will be, uh, not about the patriarchs, because this was it, but the next one will be before Prince Hassan was crowned as crown prince. So he was just the prince, then he became crown prince. We're going to see what his life was like before, as that era before we move to the next topic. All right. So thank you all so much. Thank you for joining me. God bless you all. Send me a message, comments, thumbs up. A thumbs down, uh, and uh, I am me, whatever, but God bless you all. Good night.